one. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, July 22nd. We are joined today by the Yukon Premier Sandy Silver and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. We also have with us André Boursier from French Language Services Directorate who will translate any questions from French-speaking journalists and our sign language interpretation is provided by Mary Thiessen. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have one question plus one follow-up. Premier Silver. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us again here on the traditional territory of the Kwan Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with Dr. Hanley again this week. Uh, we are almost 50, uh, sorry, 20 weeks uh, into uh, Yukon's pandemic response. It's been a long road. And uh, the off-ramp is, is not uh, coming anytime soon. Uh, we are, uh, we're now at a point in time where we need to learn to live with uh, the reality of COVID-19. Uh, we must now work forward towards that new normal uh, for our lives in the, in the weeks and months to come. Uh, it is possible and likely uh, that we will see new cases uh, in Yukon before a vaccine is, uh, is available. Um, since releasing the Path Forward plan on May the 15th, we have made gradual steps to, uh, to lift restrictions, only possible because of the diligence of Yukoners. Um, in Phase 1, we saw the reopening of personal services, daycares, and uh, early childhood uh, learning spaces, restaurants. In Phase 2, we saw bars reopening at uh, limited capacity, and the border restrictions between British Columbia, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut lifted, as well as visitors from other Canadian provinces welcome in with proper self-isolating protocols. Now, as we approach August the 1st, we are considering how we can continue to lift restrictions while also keeping Yukoners safe. We are working with outfitters to determine how they can, come, uh, how they can welcome guests safely. Every outfitter will need to develop an operational plan that ensures guests stay out of contact with other Yukoners while they're in our territory. We're very pleased to have uh, determined a way to move ahead with the outfitter season uh, and know that outfitters will follow these recommendations because they also appreciate the need to keep Yukoners safe. While there are Yukoners who want us to move forward quickly, there are others that are feeling that we're moving too fast. As we have been throughout this process, we are balancing these levels of concerns with the science, the epidemiology of the virus. In speaking with Dr. Hanley and his team, we have determined that we will not be lifting travel restrictions currently in place between Yukoners, Yukon and other Canadian provinces just yet. With the recent increase in cases in the South, uh, we will continue to require Canadians from provinces other than British Columbia, Northwest Territories and, Nun and Nunavut Territories to self-isolate for 14 days when they arrive in Yukon. We will also continue to limit gatherings uh, to keep the numbers low. We are considering how to uh, change the restrictions around gathering size and family bubbles, uh, but again, we must determine what is safe to do so, and I know Dr. Hanley will expand upon on that. Uh, we have seen how risky social gatherings can be and have recently seen significant spread resulting from private gatherings in people's homes and in other indoor spaces in other regions in Canada and in the States. I was reminded by Dr. Hanley that the cases that we've seen in Yukon have come from people returning to the Yukon. That is to say, uh, all of our cases, uh, they were contracted uh, outside of the territory um, and, uh, and folks came back uh, with the virus. Um, this indicates that we do not have community spread in the Yukon yet, and that's a, an extremely good thing. It shows that Yukoners are being careful, uh, and they are following the safety protocols and doing their best to keep themselves and their families safe, for the most part. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, we know it's not easy, I know it's not easy, uh, but we need to keep up our efforts. On our side, we are enhancing our enforcement efforts. As I mentioned last week, we are launching a system to identify vehicles with, uh, with territory, out-of-territory plates <coughs> that are authorized to be here. Uh, the visitor uh, decals uh, will be uh, 
uh, will be provided to, and these will be provided uh, to critical uh, service providers and travelers who have uh, completed their 14-day self-isolation requirements, including Canadians with uh, plates from jurisdictions out of, outside of British Columbia, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, uh, also to Americans uh, providing essential services in the Yukon, and foreign residents uh, that have been permitted entry to Canada by the Canadian Border Service Agency. The green visitor decal, uh, which I have here, uh, will be placed on the driver's side windshield to indicate that the occupants are authorized to travel in and around Yukon. Visitor decals, uh, decals uh, will, be, uh, will not be issued to travelers in transit. Uh, anyone who has not yet finished their 14-day uh, mandatory self-isolation period uh, they will not be issued to vehicles from jurisdictions that are already part of the mobility bubble. Uh, that includes British Columbia, Nunavut, Northwest Territories, unless they specifically request them. Enforcement officers, uh, SEMA enforcement officers, will issue uh, visitor uh, decals to travelers who have a, uh, a legitimate reason for being here in the Yukon. Enforcement officers will continue to be stationed at our borders and we uh, will move, as we move towards and into, excuse me, phase three, uh, to inform those entering of the rules and the expectations uh, to follow upon entry. I want to thank the enforcement officers uh, that have been doing exceptional work to educate visitors and investigate complaints that have come up. Uh, the folks that are on the telephone information lines and answering the emails, thank you very much for uh, being such a positive voice of information to those who have concerns and questions. I, uh, I know that travelers, including those in transit from the United States, are, uh, are causing anxiety here and throughout Western Canada. I join in Premier uh, Horgan from British Columbia in calling for stronger enforcement measures at, Canadian, at Canada's southern borders. We are expecting the uh, Canadian Border Service Agency to announce further measures to both inform and to track U.S. travelers entering into Canada. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Minister Stryker and his team and community services uh, for the continuing engagement with our counterparts in British Columbia, but also with the federal government in this really important initiative. We welcome efforts to keep Americans in transit informed of their responsibilities as they pass through our country, as well as enforcing the rules that are already in place. We will continue to work with our provincial and federal partners to protect the health and safety of Yukoners and all Canadians. Once again, I must thank Yukoners for all that they are doing. Uh, we have made tremendous sacrifices, and that is not an easy thing to do. Thank you. Uh, continue uh, to do what you need to do for you, Connors. Wash your hands. Stay home if you are feeling sick. Travel very respectfully through the communities. Self-isolate as required. Limit the number of gatherings, uh, people in your gatherings. It's 50 for outside gatherings and 10 inside uh, if you can stay two meters apart. Uh, and keep practicing physical distancing. If you are following these steps, we can greatly reduce our own risk and more importantly, the risk to others. And keeping check on people that are around you, your neighborhood, your community, it will it is always important to Yukoners. We are still in the midst of a very difficult time. Uh, offer to help your neighbors or family members, reach out to your loved ones and be kind to others. It's the Yukon way. We are in this together and we will get through this together. Thank you very much for your time today, uh, Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Premier. And good afternoon, bon après-midi. Everything that you and I have done together to date has led to where we are today, on our way to phase three of the path forward to recovery. Over the past several weeks, both the Premier and I have referenced the beginning of phase three anticipated to be August 1st, and I believe we're still on track for that. However, phase three will be a long phase. While we had looked forward to removing the self-isolation requirements on August 1st for some of the other jurisdictions in Canada, and we have been keeping an eye on Alberta in particular, 
I feel that we're not quite ready to do that. I'm not comfortable with the numbers I'm seeing, nor with the level of risk that exists for us to be able to remove that requirement for self-isolation for Albertans. We're watching a few other jurisdictions, and given what we are presently seeing in BC, we need to take a few more weeks to get a better picture on which way the trends are going. Of course, we're closely watching BC, and with the recent rises in cases primarily in the Kelowna area, I have to caution anyone uh, going to BC to take precautions, and I'll touch on that a bit later. Um, I want to make sure that, that you, Connors, who are traveling to Kelowna in particular, that you're very careful on your return. If you develop any symptoms, ensure that you carry out the self-assessment or call 811 to get advice on being tested. Keep a low profile after coming back. Avoid social gatherings, especially large or, or random social gatherings. And of course, stay well-spaced for others and pay special attention to the other features of the Safe Six. So although we are going ahead with phase three, uh, given how well we've been doing in the current phase, phase three will start slowly and progress slowly. Closing the borders back in March was a swift and heavy tool that we needed to put into place to protect ourselves and our health system. The border actions and enforcements, along with enforced self-isolation measures, allowed us time to gather our resources, prepare and plan for the arrival of COVID-19 in Yukon. And I'm confident now in our ability to test as necessary, to trace contacts as required. I'm confident in the healthcare system's surge plan and in our capacity to respond to an outbreak. We've had the time and the advantage as being a small jurisdiction to act quickly and to learn from others. But we also know that the closed society has contributed to many of what we might call the side effects of COVID closure on our society. We have for some time categorized the human toll in mental health consequences, substance use harms and overdoses, domestic violence, severe financial distress to individuals, communities and businesses. We know that eventually we must move away from enforcement at the borders as we have started to do with the BC Northern bubble and the removal of the restricted entry order. We need to move slowly towards a point where self-isolation is not mandated at the borders upon entry, but becomes more of an individual tool when necessary to be used for an individual in contact with COVID or coming from a high risk area to undergo. Enforcement eventually is better applied at settings where COVID risk is higher, in workplaces, bars, restaurants, and other premises where adjustments to reduce the chances of outbreaks and exposures have had to be made. And by the way, we are doing very well there overall. Inspections of bars, restaurants, and workplaces have shown overwhelmingly strong compliance with the necessary guidance. Phase three will include changes to the double to the double bubble, the two household bubble, and how we will interact with people we know. Expanding the social circle can be important for many reasons. It allows us to connect with family and friends, which in turn supports good mental health, and it allows for additional supports for child care or elder care if needed. It also allows for rapid contact tracing in the event of a case of COVID-19 within a social circle. It's far simpler to trace and isolate COVID-19 if we know who an individual has been in touch with. We will be developing gu guidance and criteria on what exactly we, were, we will be advising. For the time being, I will say it'll be a little less prescriptive about maintaining a two-household bubble, but will be more about holding your social circles small well-behaved and consistent. This soft launch of phase three by August 1st also permits us to re-examine our direction for gatherings. I'm still concerned about indoor gatherings, particularly house parties with and other areas with close indoor contact. The limit to household 
uh, social gatherings will remain at 10. These gatherings should continue to include members of your bubble or close social circle only. Otherwise, indoor visitors should ensure that they are well and appropriately spaced. We are working on specific guidelines for indoor seated and planned events, allowing events that are planned, organized, supervised, and seated in various indoor facilities, whether community halls or other spaces, is much, sa much safer than where people are mingling and congregating. This would allow ceremonies such as weddings and funerals outside of churches to take place or allow a sewing circle or some such other event to be hosted. Last week, I, uh, we announced that we were expanding the testing criteria, as had been uh, um, anticipated before then. So uh, testing has uh, has gone up since then, and uh, some of this, uh, some of these uh, increased testing numbers may be attributed to individuals uh, concerned after the border opening on July first, um, as well as Yukoners returning from travel outside Yukon. Of course, we now have a broader symptom list, uh, so we have been um, been testing individuals with a with a wider uh, variety of of symptoms. Um, so far, um, we've had uh, 79. I think we have some revisions uh, as of today, um, but more or less a doubling of uh, testing numbers in, in, in the last uh, week since the testing criteria uh, changed. 13 cases in the last five months, again, as, as, the, Premier, um, as, as the Premier mentioned, are all related to the Yukoners who have traveled outside of Yukon. Our two most recent cases are Yukoners who came into contact with dis the disease outside of the territory and who will remain outside until recovered, and both are doing well. As we slowly m move away from enforcement, I want to touch a little bit on personal and community responsibility. I know well the COVID fatigue that is wearing us down four months in. And we know the effects of these relapses occurring, whether in Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, recently in the Okanagan. When we stop practicing physical distancing, good hand hygiene, or staying home when we're sick, when we let our guard down, that's when we let the disease back in. We do have a shared responsibility to each other, and it's our responsibility to do the right thing to adhere to the safe six. And if you think it's not important for you individually, think about all the people you come into contact with. When it comes to COVID, young people may feel invincible. They, f they feel they can perhaps be exposed to COVID and, and get away with it. And for the most part, that's true. They, they will tolerate COVID very well, but they're not completely immune. And the more that young people will be affected, the more risk there is for one of those to get severe disease. But as well, the higher risk is in transmitting the disease to others and in bringing it, potentially bringing it home to people that will be more vulnerable, whether that's people with underlying medical conditions or our older people. I know many many engaged and passionate young people here, and we need all our youth and young adults to help protect those who aren't invincible. We need, all to, we need all of us to think of someone who we want to protect. Maybe a father-in-law who's undergoing chemo, a grandparent who is at risk because of age and inability to fight the disease, or even a middle-aged single parent who has to work to support her children and who can't afford to stay home, but will have to do so if sick. So we all have a personal responsibility and we need as one large community to help each other. Remember the three C's I have borrowed and mentioned many times. These are still to be remembered as the higher risk settings for COVID, closed spaces, crowds, close contact with others. They're also at the risk of um, alliterative fatigue. There are also three positive C's that will help us get through this caring, community-minded, and calm. Let's look out for each other and look after each other in a calm way. 
help each other, help, help others by keeping yourself safe and supporting others as they navigate these difficult times. Remember Team Yukon, we're still a team and we're still not even at half time in this long, long game. Let's stick together in spirit, even as we maintain our distance. And let's keep up our respect for and trust in others and trust ourselves to do the right thing for our community. Thank you, merci, merci Cho. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Premier Silver. We'll now go to the phone lines and we'll start with Doug from Shown FM. Thank you. Am I here? Okay. Um, my uh, question is for Dr. Hanley. There has been uh, a lot of back and forth about the use of, or the mandatory use of uh, face masks. And I know I asked the question last week, but uh, I'd like to hear it straight from you. Is there a threshold where the mandatory use of uh, face masks will be implemented? Thanks for that question. Um, and it's, it's a good question, and it's probably one I think that uh, is worth asking every every now and then, and, and revisiting and noting. Um, again, I think Calgary just recently made masks mandatory. No, I'm still not in favor of making masks um, mandatory, and uh, it's certainly not mandatory for healthy people in Yukon to wear masks um, in public at this time. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a personal decision. I do recommend, um, as I have uh, reiterated and, and, and again taken from the advice of the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada, that masks should be worn in places, uh, particularly indoor spaces, where physical spacing cannot be maintained. And there, there have been a few cases of where we have uh, uh, either strongly recommended or advised um, masks um, or even written them into uh, into our guidance and, and an example of that is in um, uh, personal care um, settings where physical space can sometimes it needs to be broached in order to uh, uh, get get uh, the hair, your hair done or a haircut um, we have um, we do say in our guidance that masks should be worn um, I know that um, Whitehorse City Transit uh, will be um, uh, using my advice uh, to recommend masks when uh, using public uh, transit, um, and that's anticipated. Um, mask uh, usage is um, part of a, re um, uh, a requirement now in uh, in Yukon Airport. So there's there's definitely growing um, growing use, um, and uh, I think an, a, a growing um, uh, growing. Um, uh, place for masks in certain settings, but particularly again that emphasis where um, where physical spacing can't be maintained. And I, I think there needs to be more comfort with people using masks and, and feeling comfortable using masks in those settings. Fortunately, uh, as again I've said before, we were lucky to have very few places uh, to uh, very where that where mask use um, is um, advisable, just because we have in general lots of space and a well spaced facility um, should not require the use of masks. So if the other measures, the the, the the safe six are observed, given where we are, given our absence of of um, community transmission, our paucity of cases. Um, I think this is a this is a comfortable place for us to be in. So I'd like to see more more comfort um, with with the use of masks, especially where people choose to use them. But I feel a, a long way from uh, mandating mask use. Do you have a follow up question, Doug? No, thank you. Thank you. We'll move now to Tim at CKRW. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my question is for the Premier, and it's in regards to the uh, education uh, changes uh, that were announced, and uh, the government's been receiving some uh, uh, some certainly some some feedback about the the MAD program, the move regarding grade ten to twelve, and uh, the movement of uh, grade eights from FH over to Wood Street. Just wondering uh, who made that decision. And uh, if it was a government decision and not from Dr. Hanley, why did you make this decision and will you make any adjustments? 
Uh, thanks, Tim, for the question. Uh, you know, again, as we've been saying, uh, you know, this is not an ordinary situation, uh, and uh, this will not be an ordinary school year, not in Yukon, not in Canada. Uh, and, um, you know, this is about putting the interests of the students first, uh, and our focus is always on ensuring that as many students as possible can return to, uh, to full day in-class instruction. Uh, Minister McPhee did meet with uh, many of the demonstrators that we've had here uh, yesterday, and uh, had a very good decision, a, a very good conversation. Um, she heard the concerns uh, and was able to clear up a lot of misinformation as well uh, that was out there about the plans and how this year, uh, you know, came to be. Um, I know that there's been weekly updates uh, from the minister and her team. I, I want to commend the Department of, 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 uh, of Education, the principals, the school councils, uh, the educational partners uh, right across the territory who have worked together uh, to ensure that students uh, will return to class next month. And uh, that's extremely important that we have kids returning, students returning um, in, these, uh, in, in these extraordinary times. And our focus has always been as a government uh, to, uh, to make sure that we move forward with the, the safety of our students most in mind. Follow up? Yeah, I, we didn't answer who made the decision. We, we, we made the decision. As uh, a government? You know, absolutely. And, uh, of course, every decision that we're making during a pandemic, uh, it, it, it does follow recommendations from public health, um, you know, whether it's opening up of bars and restaurants uh, or, or what we do uh, to make sure that we have the, the, the social distancing, the, uh, the, the, the parameters in place for, for, for our education citizens as well, uh, our students as well. Uh, but, again, uh, consultation uh, with uh, with the schools with the school councils uh, you know you know the the department makes these decisions uh, with the safety of the students in mind but they make it with the educational community uh, at hand as well Tim okay. do you have a follow-up yeah thanks thanks Pat um, uh, yeah just in regards to the the legislative assembly and again another issue where we're getting some blowback on there have been other legislative assemblies meeting across the country. I know it is summertime and a lot of people are camping right now, but would you consider, and I, I know we're due for an early October start date, but would you consider maybe starting in mid-September? Because uh, there's certainly a lot to talk about. So, you know, again, uh, when it comes to uh, whether or not we're going to uh, meet in the Legislative Assembly, you know, the Legislative Assembly is to pass bills. Uh, when it comes to emergency spending, we will do what uh, this government has done for decades, whether it be for COVID or for floods or forest fires. Uh, whenever there's emergency spending that wasn't uh, already passed in the, uh, in the spring budget, we will have a supplementary budget. This, all the spending will be, uh, will be analyzed and will run through the, the uh, appropriate uh, legislative scrutiny um, and uh, you know so until we have a need to open up the legislative assembly uh, that's when we will when we have the bills ready um, and uh, again you know we've made offers to the opposition to uh, to come in and to and to uh, ask questions supplementary budget main budget whatever they have in mind in all the departments uh, with the uh, assistant deputy ministers deputy ministers available they refuse to come in for those questions we've offered uh, the orders and council that deal with COVID for briefings in there. Haven't heard back from them on that. Uh, so wanting to, uh, you know, the scrutiny of the Legislative Assembly is a, is, uh, is a great place for sure. And uh, we're, we, you know, we're getting ready for the, for the fall and we'll look forward to, uh, to defending uh, our decisions to keep UConners safe. Thank you. We'll move now to Gabrielle from Whitehurst Star. Hi, I'm hoping, Dr. Hanley, could you elaborate a bit on the recommendation that UConn is returning from BC keep a low profile? What, is, what does that look like? Yeah, thanks. And, and really, um, I, I think this needs to be our, our language of, um, although to, to a large extent it's always been our language, I think it needs to be our language for the, for the future, is that people are mindful of travel, as Dr. Henry says um, herself. Um, bring your travel manners with you, uh, travel wisely, so that when you are traveling, make sure that you're respecting um, the, uh, the, 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 the requests and the requirements of BC, as our, um, which are very close to our own. 
um, maintaining that physical distancing and, and avoiding those those um, random um, events uh, and gatherings that have been associated with the cases in, in, in Kelowna. So really your goal when you travel out is to obviously try to avoid exposure and and try to avoid bringing COVID back into into Yukon. So specifically, um, I think when you're aware that you've been in an area that is subject to active cases and an outbreak, uh, as in the Kelowna area since uh, early July, late late June, early July, that you just be aware that you you may have been exposed. Um, so keep what does keeping a profile mean? It means um, just being mindful of symptoms, uh, keeping a watch, and make if you do develop any any symptoms any new symptoms, um, um, call for assessment, um, call, do the self-assessment or call 811. I would, I would advise you to be very careful about, um, um, social, social gatherings and, and making, taking extra precaution to avoid, uh, to avoid social gatherings. It's so it doesn't mean, uh, you have to self-isolate, uh, but, but it means you need to be very aware of, of where you're being and just be very prudent. Follow up, Gabrielle. Hi, I'm also wondering if there's an update to the number of complaints made to the enforcement line. I know, um, Premier Silver, you said last week that there are quite a few being made in relation to out-of-territory license plates, and I'm just wondering if that's still happening. I, I don't have an updated number uh, right here for you, Gabrielle. But what I can do is and talk to I can talk with Minister Stryker to get you that information. Um, I, I will say, um, you know, having phone calls with chief and councils and John's having, uh, Minister Stryker having conversations with the mayors and councils and anecdotal information, um, you know, we, we hear a lot of, of, of com concern. Um, it doesn't translate necessarily to the amount, to the volume of calls that, that are, are, uh, are being uh, reported at, uh, and I'll give you the phone number here. It's one 374 425 You know, we, we know that uh, uh, a lot of cases, the, the, the license plates that people do see, uh, they're people that do have the ability, uh, do have the right to be here. Um, you know, I have note here about, you know, in a major, a majority of the cases of the complaints that we do get, uh, enforcement has received, uh, it's about out of territory plates, uh, end up being about vehicles uh, who have uh, been here since before the border measures were introduced, or they belong to people that have completed their self-isolation and, and can be here. In other cases, there are uh, plates uh, that could belong to our neighbours from Skagway or from Haines uh, that are here to access essential medical services and they cannot get home. Um, someone transitioning uh, through uh, may have some vehicle issues and need to get some repairs. Uh, lodging on destination routes uh, for, for uh, you know, uh, may be fully booked and a family uh, with, a young, with young children may need to rest so that they're safe and secure in completing their transit. Uh, so these are the types of of, of uh, complaints and then the follow-up that we do see for, for, uh, from these, these phone lines and from also from COVID-19 enforcement at gov.yk.ca. Uh, I think it's important to, to, to always reiterate when we're talking about uh, border provisions, uh, thousands uh, of, of Alaskan travel, uh, vehicles to going towards Alaska have, have, have safely transitioned through uh, Yukon, and we have not reported a single COVID case based upon that traffic stream. We do know that there's a lot of concerns for sure. We'd ask you if you see a plate, th the decal is going to help out quite a bit as well. If you see this decal on somebody's uh, vehicle without a f out of territory plates, uh, you know that they've done the right things and they can be where they are. Uh, but really, Dr. Hanley and I really want to have a message today of what keeps us up at night is the parties, um, you know, the, the people that aren't doing the proper uh, um, uh, social distancing, people that think it's been a long road and I'm kind of kind of sick of, of doing what we need to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard, we get it, but that's that's the big issue. You know, I'm seeing a lot more uh, Yukoners uh, on, on social media, you know, calling people out, you know, you, you posted a picture, you're too close, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, being very vigilant and helping out your neighbors to make sure that they know what they're doing. If we concentrate our efforts on, on making sure that you Yukoners are keeping Yukoners safe, then Dr. Hanley and I will be able to sleep a lot easier. Um, and you know, knowing that the uh, federal government is boosting up their Alaskan provisions, 
um, and more details to come on that. Uh, very, you know, much more restrictive uh, with a lens to uh, to um, to try to curtail that loophole that we've been hearing about a bit. Uh, you know, making sure that their measures match up with our measures, making sure that they at the border know what the rules are in the jurisdictions that people transit through uh, is extremely important. Uh, but um, but again, um, uh, the. The complaints that are coming in, that's kind of that's usually the responses that we're getting, uh, but we're still maintaining vigilance when it comes to making sure that people on their way to Alaska uh, stay on their route and, uh, and keep our, our communities safe. Thank you. We'll move now to Chris, CBC. Hi, thanks. Um, I, I guess I, I'm curious to know with the uptick in cases in, in British Columbia, how close are we to a situation where um, Dr. Hanley might consider uh, the need to revisit these uh, loosening of border restrictions and, and maybe reimpose some of these restrictions on travel from British Columbia? If I, if I could, before Dr. Hanley uh, um, uh, comments, um, I think it's a really important question, Chris. Um, in Kelowna, we're talking about a couple of parties, you know, and those couple of parties uh, created dozens and dozens and dozens of cases. Um, so I think the message again here is, you know, for our younger Yukoners, we, we implore you, please, uh, for, the, for the safety of yourselves, but more importantly, the safety, safety of people with com uh, compromised immune systems, uh, our elderly, you know, your grandparents, these types of things, please. Um, we're, we're not out of the woods and we really need Yukoners, especially our young people. We're seeing a lot of trends and upticks in, in, in these cases in younger populations. We need you more than ever to stand up for the rest of you, Connors. Uh, Dr. Hanley, if you want to. Yeah, thanks. And it's a great question. Thanks for that. And um, and obviously, I, I am concerned. We're watching closely. And, uh, and, and we do expect to see more cases associated with that. Um, um, Kelowna, following what uh, the um, Dr. Henry and others are, are, are saying. Um, However, um, that 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 is um, it is still a, a, a reasonably isolated um, area. So we're talking about basically the Kelowna area. Now there are some increases in other parts of BC, um, but really relatively small increases that we're seeing in the in the Lower Mainland, for example. Um, so, um, so this is, you know, COVID behaving as it does, um, outbreaks occurring with a, um, as the premier says, associated with a couple of private uh, parties and then the consequences of those young people, um, carrying the, the, uh, um, infection into, uh, bars and restaurants and other, uh, other parties along the waterfront area in Kelowna. So I would be, as long as this stays, uh, a, a localized event, I would be much more inclined to maintain my to keep advice um, around perhaps maybe more segmented advice so uh, you know just right now advising if, if you are traveling to Kelowna be very aware uh, be, be you know keep an, keep an eye on what's happening be aware of your contacts um, and uh, and if you have been in in that area especially in the the, the active area uh, to be very prudent when you're when you're coming back. Um, uh, so would, you know, depending on what happens, would we change that to more of a, um, a, a recommendation to, to self-isolate if you've been in that area or to even avoid travel? Possibly. Those, the, those would be, I think, areas that we, we might contemplate, um, advising you, Connors, on. Um, but I would be, uh, I, I would be much less inclined to advise, um, going back on our BC bubble, um, unless we were to see something much more widespread and much more of a, a kind of a clear and present threat, uh, you might say. Follow up, Chris. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess the other, the other question I have is with regards to mostly American travelers, but I suppose this also could apply to uh, folks from outside the bubble as well. Can you just, uh, I guess, elaborate on uh, the, the the obligations of, of businesses in terms of serving people? I'm thinking specifically in terms of bars and restaurants. Like, do they have either a duty? Um, do they have like a duty to to refuse service to folks uh, from outside the bubble uh, who are also outside the travel corridor? You know, it's. 
It's a good question. Uh, we have had uh, folks from businesses contact us about exactly these uh, these uh, initiatives. But uh, if you're traveling into Yukon and if you're told what you have to do, it's your responsibility, ultimately. It's hard, again, for a business owner to really know without pushing uh, in certain circumstances whether or not somebody is supposed to be there or not supposed to be there. You know, we've heard people offering up to business owners uh, in, in Dawson, for example, where I've had folks that would call me and say, this person just told me they're not self-isolating. And so I get them to call the phone line and we get the officials, uh, the seaman enforcement officers to do what they do. So. So first, I want to thank those businesses that, that are keeping up with, with the with the rules, not only necessarily just for their businesses and making sure that their customers are safe, but also understanding the parameters for people that are traveling as well. Um, so it, it, the responsibility is on the individuals, for sure. Uh, but again, it, it, it's a serious issue that we, we are working with BC, with Premier Horgan on, uh, as far as uh, the, the, the BC, the, the United States border. I've offered, I've, I've added my voice uh, to his to call for stronger restrictions on the southern borders. Um, you know, people who have essential reasons, essential reasons to get into Alaska, well, they do have alternative routes. You know, you can fly, uh, you can take the ferry systems as well. Uh, so as we track and monitor the international situation, the, the United States situation, uh, we are keeping an eye on uh, on the traffic. Uh, again, and I know I sound like a broken record, but you know we have yet to have a single case of COVID-19 transmitted uh, related to United States travel. Uh, so you know the, the the provisions that are put in place, the diligence of Yukoners, whether it be business owners or not, uh, has been proven to be effective so far. Uh, but we are not taking our our sight off of the situation, and we are ramping up our participation at the federal level, at the national level with our with our colleagues in British Columbia as well. Okay, we'll move now to uh, Jackie, Yukon News. Hi. Um, this week, the Narwhal published a story uh, that said the Yukon is quote, being, quote, flooded, unquote, with mushroom pickers who are ignoring COVID-19 restrictions. Um, I'm wondering if the Yukon government is following up on um, this report saying that there are mushroom pickers and buyers who are essentially lying to get into the territory and to get to these burns and pick. Um, I would say we're we're definitely keeping monitoring this not the situation not based upon Narwhal but based upon uh, the participation of the the Yukon First Nations chiefs and counselors in our weekly updates and also the municipalities as well. Uh, I know that many of our ministers, uh, Dr. Hanley's office as well, we've we've heard the uh, the the, the uh, situation, the complaints, the concerns in communities. We're working very closely with First Nations uh, uh, partners to address the concerns about the uh, morale pickers. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have stopped issuing permits uh, for this year, um, you know, and you know again we're urging everybody to be very respectful uh, to those people that are traveling throughout our territory. Um, and if you do have any questions or concerns about people who you think should or should not be in a certain area, as opposed to approaching them uh, and being hostile, we're we're encouraging you to uh, to phone in the, at the fo the phone line again one eight seven seven three seven Four zero four two five, or also email COVID nineteen enforcement at gov.yk.ca. Uh, so monitoring the situation absolutely, but not based upon an article. Where, where it's based upon uh, the uh, the amazing participation that we've seen with uh, with the First Nations governments and the municipalities as well. Thank you. Follow up question, Jackie. Yeah, uh, Dr. Henley and Premier Silver, you've both mentioned uh, you're both or young people to not have parties, not have uh, these gatherings to kind of stick it out. I'm wondering if any enforcement officers have actually responded to any reports of parties or gatherings, over 50 people outdoors, 10 people indoors, whether any warnings have been issued as well. Uh, I'm not sure about the actual enforcement as far as uh, whether warnings have been uh, been been given out or not. I know that there have been um, some calls in after the fact as well, which is not as helpful. Um, what we do see is a lot of people pointing to social media and saying, "Look, we just saw in this particular community or in this town, uh, you know, evidence of something that might have been after the fact." Um, I, I would have to get uh, Minister Stryker to uh, to parse out the numbers as far as what amount of the calls that are coming in uh, that a previous journalist asked about and how, what 
what part of those uh, were specifically to people not self-isolating or gathering in, in, in gatherings larger than what is acceptable? And I'll, I'll get that information for you. Thank you. We move now to Mario, Radio-Canada. Hi there. Yeah, uh, my first question actually is for, for our French listeners, uh, if uh, Mr. Anneli can answer just in French. Peut-être juste nous donner un petit résumé de ce qui va changer et ce qui va pas changer avec la première, avec la troisième phase, euh, si ça entre en, en, en jeu euh, le, le 3 août. Donc, ce qui va changer, par exemple, comme vous l'avez dit, là, les, les restrictions... Euh, ou les, 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 les bulles de famille, et ce qui ne va pas changer les restrictions par rapport au, euh, au voyage. Si vous pouviez me dire ça en français, ce serait très sympathique. So, the question is for Dr. Henley. Can you please give a small uh, 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 resume of what you said uh, about what will change and what will not change uh, with phase three? Oui, merci. Et euh, c'est pour premièrement pour expliquer que le, la troisième phase, c'est euh, c'est prévu pour une longue durée. Donc, on a beaucoup de temps et on n'est pas pressé de faire des, des mesures euh, tout de suite, surtout les mesures à la frontière. Donc, pour le pour le moment, les, les mesures euh, restent euh, aux frontières. Euh, mais pour, pour le, on prévoit pour, pour la long terme que les mesures aux frontières sera, sera graduellement euh, enlevées et euh, l'enforcement va, va euh, plutôt sur l'inspection des, 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 des facilités des, des restaurants, des bars, des, des, des autres endroits où on a des régulations, des, 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 des recommandations en place. La quarantaine euh, reste euh, ouverte avec le nom et avec euh, Colombie-Britannique, mais pour le moment, ça veut dire pour, le, pour les prochaines une, deux, peut-être trois semaines euh, ou, ou même plus, on va rester avec euh, la quarantaine pour les autres euh, provinces. Um, et uh, donc on va on va pas um, entrer dans les uh, uh, avec uh, un uh, on va pas enlever la quarantaine la 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 la, 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 la commande de quarantaine pour les autres provinces pour le moment donc on, on a besoin plus de temps pour faire une analyse uh, et, et de, de um, de suivre la situation euh, en Alberta et dans les autres provinces. Euh, et euh, donc, on va, on, va, euh, euh, on va faire des changements euh, aux boules, euh, euh, aux boules domestiques. On, on va changer la langue, euh, la langage euh, autour de, de boules domestiques et on va revenir avec plus de détails sur ça la semaine prochaine. Et euh, pour les euh, euh, pour les rassemblements des gens, on va rester avec le, le, le maximum de 10 pour l'intérieur, sauf, mais on va faire une autre catégorie, ça veut dire pour... Euh, pour les, les, les rassemblements qui sont organisés, donc ce, ce, qui sont supervisés, planifiés, organisés. Et euh, on va revenir aussi avec plus de détails euh, la semaine prochaine. Merci. Avez-vous une autre question, Mario? Oui, je pense que ma seconde question en anglais pour le Premier Silver. Uh, about the Deco, uh, is, is it expected to help active enforcement like will there be people on, on on the field looking if you know if people with plates have these decals or not or is it are we really with this hoping more to uh you know alleviate uh or, or help better make the complaints uh, at least more easier for for you Connors? Yeah, thank you for the question, and uh, yeah, that, that's my accent. I, I, I call them decals. Uh, I'm sure they're decals, but um, uh, so I, I think the most important thing here is is that there's many valid reasons why folks are uh, in 
uh, in Yukon and not on transportation routes towards Alaska. This definitely will help out, you know, seeing the, the decal on, on vehicles. And if you're concerned about it, if it was at a box store or downtown or at a grocery store, uh, with this decal, there'd, there'd be less calls into the enforcement. Um, again, I want to give a shout out to Toronto Cochin. Uh, you know, the, their government, uh, when you're coming into uh, Dawson City, uh, they, you know, for Yukon uh, uh, situation, they kind of invented it. Uh, you know, they had a check mark for locals so that they didn't have to you know, go into the to the check stops all the time, and it was a really effective tool to uh, uh, to not have the folks that are doing enforcement uh, or or information uh, having to uh, to to keep on rechecking vehicles that were okay. Um, I know that uh, Minister Stryker's team, uh, Minister McPhee's team, has been working with the federal government as well uh, as far as further uh, information on uh, how we can do a very similar thing for folks that are on a on a transportation uh, route to a lot. So more details to come on that, but really for right now, this is going to be very helpful for for what we hear is a big uh, concern. Uh, but you know, I've been on the mic before saying, you know, in Dawson there was you know something like 15 complaints all about the same vehicle with uh, American plates, but that person was a third generation Yukoner. You know, so you know these decals, uh, if they were on that vehicle, we wouldn't have as many complaints. Uh, it's just another way that we're upping our enforcement abilities uh, and and our communications. Uh, with the uh, communities, again, borrowing ideas from the Toronto Quichin government uh, and also uh, a lens to working with the federal government on, uh, on, on more decals when it comes to uh, travellers, uh, international travellers on their way to Alaska. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Premier Silver and Dr. Hanley. Thank you everyone for your time today. Our next COVID-19 update is scheduled for Wednesday, July 29th at 2 p.m.